Welcome to 33 Founders, a series about founders of the coolest startups. Brought to you by 33 Voices and hosted by Chase Jennings and Jenna Abdul. I'm Simone and this is my brother Jake and we started the, the company VolunteerNation.org. We're a youth-led, volunteer-driven nonprofit organization and we help youth connect with volunteer opportunities throughout the nation and hopefully we are able to expand throughout the world in the next year. Awesome. So I know you started out pretty young, so let's rewind. I want to rewind with you both eight years and say that we're sitting at the Bernstein dinner table and Simone has just come home and she's 12 years old and she can't find any volunteer opportunities for herself. Can you tell us what that conversation was like and what moments Simone really made you tick and realize I need to do something to change this? Well, when I was 12, my dad was deployed in the military, and I realized that he was giving back for our country, and the community was giving back to support us as a family. And so I wanted to do something as well. But I continued to contact organizations, and they continually rejected me as a volunteer at age 12 due to liability concerns. And so I wanted to be able to find opportunities. I contacted multiple organizations and luckily found one that allowed me to volunteer, but realized when I was older that there were so many kids that had the same concerns concerns as me. They had been rejected as well and didn't know where to go. So we decided to create a local organization at that time and then two and a half years later created a national organization to help youth throughout the country connect with volunteer opportunities. So before we really dive in a lot deeper into volunteering, um, I want to know more about you guys personally. It's super clear to me that service is really a guiding principle in both of your lives. So can you maybe tell us uh, some of your favorite experiences serving the community and how it impacted you? Definitely. Well, one of my favorite opportunities was when we were younger, uh, we noticed that our neighbors had always come to our house and they enjoyed playing with the tennis racket. There are two kids and they're adorable twin boys on the autism spectrum. And at that point, Jake realized that it was important for them to be able to learn smart, tennis. Smart. You talk about you, I'll talk about you. We'll read that question because... You said personally, so Simone should talk about her experiences, <laughs> talk about my experiences. Um, why don't you answer that with your experiences? Okay. Um, so for me, um, you know, it struck me when, and I think volunteering um, is very much a personal experience. And so I think a lot of times what we saw when we were younger is we'd go as a group with our schools or with your religious organizations or with scouting. Uh, and I think a lot of people have had that similar experience of volunteering in a large group. And I think that's great. I think it's a great introduction to volunteerism. Um, I think you can experience some of, um, you know, the inspiration and things that may, um, you know, really inspire you in that group setting, but I think more so in an individual setting. And so I think a lot of organizations would take a group of 20, 25, 12-year-olds if you're part of a school organization. But something we saw is they wouldn't take that individual volunteer. Um, and for me, I had my, um, you know, I would say best experience when I was volunteering in a one-on-one -on -one setting. And that occurred when I met our neighbor down the street. Um, we had two twin boys who moved in um, both on the autism spectrum and talking with their family it became clear that while there was a larger network um, of families who would meet uh, and there'd be many group activities for their kids there wasn't many one-on-one -on -one, um, you know volunteers who would work with their kids and so I knew that look we have a group of 12, 13, 14 year olds who have time uh, who've played sports before who would be more than willing to work with your kids. And so from there we started to build um, a system where we would offer sports clinics for kids on the autism spectrum and just I think seeing the parents and how happy they were um, that was an inspiration to me. Uh, watching the parents, the, you know, their faces and seeing they were so happy to bring their kids. Some parents came from 45 minutes away and hour away um, just to bring their kids um, and, and seeing that we could really make that difference, I think, I think was an inspiration and my favorite experience volunteering. Do you think it, it does it just feel more authentic or a little bit more altruistic when it's a personal experience then? 
I think it definitely does. There's a combination of both, though. It's important for people to be able to realize that when they go volunteer, they don't only benefit themselves, but they also learn a lot about the community. So I think it's important for people to think in both ways and understand that when I went to volunteer, I realized that I was giving back to an organization, but also at the end of that opportunity, realized that I was extremely enthusiastic and energized to be able to go back again because I just got so much out of the experience on my own, but realized that I also can make a small kid smile in a period of five to ten minutes, and that really inspired me to give back even more. I know you guys are always around really big themes of inspiration in your life, but I, the biggest inspiration for Volunteer Nation was your dad. What have you learned from your father? I've learned that he's so supportive of us and to be able to go in and to give back to our country is such a large role and I think it's important for us to realize that although he is giving back on a larger scale, we can also have that motivation and dedication to be able to give back on our own as well and at any age you can be able to make a difference. It doesn't matter how tall you are, how small you are, how old you are, you have the power to make a difference in your community and that's one important thing that our parents told us from when we were young. Now, two th 2013 is a huge year for you guys, and you just recently um, went national. So how did you do it? What are some key things that you were telling yourself along the way? I think firstly, um, and this would apply, I think, to most young people in the community, uh, you don't have to do everything on your own. So we went out and we found um, lawyers, we found you know, very different important people in the community who are willing to help us um, achieve our goal. Absolutely, and I know part of achieving that goal is working year-round, and you both are in college right now. So as someone who is in your same position, and we, we just started this summer, what advice do you have for students who are entrepreneurs, students, and involved at school? How can you maintain your company, your academics, and the social life as well? I think one thing is you definitely don't need to split up your life in school and your organization. Um, I just had a friend at Washington University in St. Louis who went to his legal clinic and within about a month uh, they helped him achieve 501c3 nonprofit status. And so I think there are many benefits that you get um, out of being in school and also working on an organization on the side. Um, you have so many friends that are potentially interested in helping you. A lot of the best um, you know, people in the technological field are in college. A lot of the best computer scientists, a lot of the best people who could maybe help you build a website um, are sitting right next to you in class. So I think uh, there's, this is a huge opportunity to be in college and also uh, working on you know, a company and organization on the side. So how do you have like a really fulfilling sense of a work-life balance, especially with important things like family? I mean, there's times when you're just stuck, not stuck doing the work, but you're just there and you can't get away from it. How do you make time for those important things? Well, I'm passionate about everything that I'm involved in. And if it's something that I don't enjoy, I really try to stick away from it. And what I've really learned from being involved in Volunteer Nation is that at all hours of the night, I feel enthusiastic and energized to work on it. And I feel it's important to be able to realize that all of your academics and all of the other extracurriculars that you're involved in should make you feel like you're learning, but also make you feel excited. And that's really important. So you shouldn't be dreading working on your volunteer nation organization or you shouldn't be dreading working on your organic chemistry. You should be able to enjoy those things. And if you're not enjoying it and you can't make the time for it, maybe it's another, another point that you should think about and focus on something like this later on in your life. But let's say that you are enjoying it and mm -hmm. you're loving it so much, though, that it's taking away from your time with your family. What do you do then? So I, I think for me, um, there are times, to be honest, where I don't enjoy it. So I think there are times where... I'll be sitting there on my email or looking at the back-end database, and I'm, I'm looking and I'm going, you know, what am I doing right now? Uh, this is a lot of just big numbers and emails that I need to respond to. And I think when it comes to that point, I'll go to the Facebook page and pick out a picture that I, I really, um, you know, that inspires me. And I'll go back to, that, to that, those two kids um, and say, you know what, look what we provided for them. Um, our one, you know, event may have not changed their lives, but it did give kids the opportunity to continue volunteering with them. And so we built a sustainable model where these kids at one of our events um, are now continuing to go back and visit that family. And so 
uh, in terms of balance. Um, I'm not sure if I've achieved that yet, but what I do know is that I go back to those first experiences to keep me going. Um, with regards to family, um, I agree. You know, in some ways, I think that's keeping us together. Um, <laughs> we have to talk a lot. We're forced to talk a lot in college. Um, I talked to, you know, my, my roommate would always ask me, why are you talk talking to your sister? And, you know, you, you talk to your sister more than you talk to me. Um, so I think that's one thing that probably keeps us together in some ways. Um, but with our parents uh, and, you know, my little sister, I, that's something that I need to work on is spending more time talking to them. From an uh, older sister. Um, from an older sister. It's sister, great. Definitely something to work Closer. on. <laughs> Well, hey, man, you're definitely doing it right. But um, let's take a closer look at your entrepreneurial journey now. Um, how have your lives changed since you became an entrepreneur? They've significantly changed. I definitely learned a lot more probably outside the classroom than I have inside the classroom, just learning how to write an email professionally, networking with other people. There are so many things that you get out of being able to start with a very small idea that only cost us $48 to create, and then that taking that idea onto a national level and now internationally. We've really learned a lot of skills outside the classroom, and it's really beneficial to us. And it's caused us to really think about how we can teach other youth how to be entrepreneurial and allow them to realize that they can take their creative ideas with a small amount of money and really make a difference in the community. Absolutely. And just going off of that, is there something you know right now that you wish you would have known when you first started out that would have helped you accomplish your goals even faster? I think I would have turned to professionals in the community maybe even earlier. Um, so I think there's always this big emphasis on, look, this kid is doing this. Um, it's great. But in truth, you know, the website, um, when we went national, we were always scared um, to ask someone for that kind of help. So our first website was very much a simple phone book directory, um, not the most attractive thing. It served its purpose. But we pretty quickly realized, based on the amount of feedback we were getting from organizations, from kids, that there was this opportunity to go national. But we would need a better website and um, I wasn't at the point where I could build this sort of website and so we turned to some professionals and we asked them and they were willing to help so I think had we looked to that earlier we may have um, you know maybe even farther down this this path that um, you know we're currently taking so definitely don't be scared to look into your community using Twitter using social media even to ask professionals um, you know for some sort of help or advice is I, I think a good tip yeah, hashtags on Instagram, I found, have, they, they can show you tons of things. You'd be surprised. <laughs> but um, one of your greatest missions, and Simone, you've talked about this often, but it's to expose people to the amazing work that youth can do. And you specifically discussed their ability to bridge the technology gap between generations. So I'm just curious, what, what experiences have you had that have led you to feel this way? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to this summer. So this summer I was in Ecuador. Um, and... It was really interesting because most organizations abroad um, are funded in the United States or in England. So if you look at Invisible Children, if you look at a lot of these organizations, what they do is they raise money in the U.S. Um, or in Europe, and then they funnel that money into their locations abroad. And this organization was different. They were based locally, which I think is really neat. And so they would fundraise locally. They were supported locally. Um, but that meant that they also they weren't aware of how they could use social media or how they could use their website uh, to raise money. And I don't consider myself, um, you know, a programmer. I know a little bit here and there. I've experimented with AdSense. Um, I've used, a, you know, just a variety of different technology. Um, and what I was able to do was help them, um, you know, apply to PayPal for a, um, a nonprofit status so they could, they could look at raising money online. They could look at using their social media presence to raise money across the world. Um, and so I think just having that experience of using um, social media, using Facebook, using causes on Facebook, uh, using online PayPal donations um, can really help organizations um, around the world. Definitely. And speaking of tech, Simone, you're a regular contributor to the Huffington Post, which is awesome. Is there one thing that they're doing really great that you want to embody at Volunteer Nation? 
Well, something that they do so well is promote blogs and promote different initiatives that the average everyday person is working on. And we've been trying to have an everyday blog and we keep getting people involved and there's so many people who want to tell their stories, but we would love to be able to reach out to even more communities throughout the nation and throughout the world and encourage you to be able to learn how to not only put on a service project, but also to be able to encourage others to do that as well. And one way to do so is to put their service into writing. And we hope to be able to tell more stories, just like the Huffington Post does for a variety of different pieces of news. We hope to do that even more through service. Amazing. All right, now let's put on our marketing hats here for a second. Um, the volunteer mission is targeted in so many different directions. You have organizations, you have students, parents, teachers. So what's the most important tactic you've learned about marketing to a wide audience, and how do you put that into play at Volunteen? Well, our budget is very small. We have about a budget of a $1,182 a year since we are an all-volunteer-led team. So what's extremely important for youth to realize is we've been able to use free marketing resources to be able to spread our mission and our goals and to be able to connect more youth with volunteer opportunities. And that's extremely important for youth to realize if they want to start a project, there's no reason to spend money on marketing. Utilize social media resources like social um, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and you can learn so much about communicating with other people. We started with a grassroots campaign and have over 13,100 Twitter followers and that's something so important for youth to realize is we don't advertise through marketing. We don't do any of that. We don't pay for any of those materials and luckily it's really allowed us to communicate with others through those free resources online. And I think we still, <clears throat> we still have room to grow in that sense. Um, we are not a Google nonprofit currently. We applied and so if you have the Google nonprofit status, you can get free AdSense. You can get all these free and um, <clears throat> tools for nonprofits. What are your favorite social media channels to like really connect with people? My favorites are Twitter. We've tweeted about 60,000 times, and so we love to be able to connect with youth and provide them scholarship contests and volunteer opportunities. And we're also just starting with Instagram. There's a lot of things that we haven't done in the past that we really want to try to do more in the future. So we have a lot of room to grow, and we are trying to focus on a few right now, but there's a lot of things that we haven't even tried, and so we hope to do a lot more in the future. I want to talk really quickly about your Twitter presence like you guys said, you have over 13,000 followers, which is in, in itself, that's great. But I think what makes you guys stand out and really keeps people reading your posts is that you personally engage with people. How does user engagement relate to your brand and how are you going to maintain that when you guys have a billion followers? So what's important for us to realize is that we are a peer-to-peer -peer system. So we are all youth and we want to be able to communicate in that way. And we want to be able to show youth that it's important to have role models. And so we try to make it as easy as possible to be able to communicate with everyone on our team that's been involved with service. We have youth ambassadors that we try to engage as much as possible. If youth want to talk to others to in their community that are already putting on service projects to get advice. So we try to make it as easy as possible for youth to realize that it's important to be able to communicate with others and we really want to do is do our part to be able to play um, play a role in their ability to grow as service leaders. Now the next piece of the pie for you guys is forging partnerships and I know you focus heavily on that Jake so what have you learned about making relationships with people and is there a specific organization you'd really love to work with in the future? So I think what we've seen um, well I'll start with um, when we when we when we started. I think a lot of people looked at us and they said, um, "Here's our API, uh, and you can use well, everything we have, but give us credit." And so um, we were looking at there's just a, there's a few other volunteer um, there's a few other websites which offer volunteer opportunities, and they turned to us once they saw that we were getting a lot of hits, once we had a lot of followers, and they said, "Here, here, you can have this. Uh, just give us credit for it." And what we found was a lot of their volunteer databases were old, they were outdated, um, they were not sortable by age. Um, it wasn't really a personal experience of finding an opportunity. So we decided against that uh, pretty early on. And these, a lot of these organizations, um, you know, 30, 40 million dollars a year, they have 30, 40 employees, they're very large organizations. Um, and I think they wholeheartedly expected us to sort of take them up on their offer and incorporate their data into our website. Um, 
And so there was definitely an eagerness on their part to partner, uh, but we decided to sort of hold out. And what we've tried to do is really partner with organizations um, on a much more personal basis. So that could be through Twitter. And so we found organizations who have been willing to look at our mission and say, this is neat. These are kids that are doing this and we're going to partner with you guys. Um, and so we don't have, I would say, one specific partner, but there are definitely organizations who provide different service learning opportunities, um, which we definitely like to promote. And we think the things they're doing are great. Um, there have been times when we've been sitting in meetings, and I think this is probably true with all, um, you know, anyone under, you know, 25, 26, you know, you get these people who are, uh, have been in the nonprofit industry for 30, 40 years, um, and uh, they're a little skeptical, I'd say. And so that's been a challenge. That was definitely a challenge before entering college. Um, I think it's given us a little credibility now that we uh, are, you know, a little over 18. Um, but that was definitely a challenge when we first started was getting that credibility to make partnerships. Um, and we look forward to, you know, doing more of that in the future. Well, I were to talk about your credibility, I think we can say you guys are some two pretty credible people at age 20 and age 18. You guys were featured on Forbes 30 under 30 social entrepreneurs list. So huge congratulations from us. That's a tremendous, tremendous accomplishment. Can you tell us about the moment you found out you were featured? Who found out first? I did. So <laughs> I received the phone call and it was really exciting. And we felt so humbled to be included on the list. And just being able to scroll through and see the others, connect with the others, has been truly an incredible experience. And that's what we really are so appreciative of, is being able to connect with the others that are doing amazing things and learning from them and then being able to partner from with them and being able to connect with them on social media has been amazing. And so that's what's so important for us to realize is that when we're able to connect with more people, we're able to learn about their mission, what the great work they're doing is, and able to discuss things in the future and hopefully partner, like you said, later on. Sorry, is there one person on the list that you were just so excited to be featured with? <laughs> That's a hard question to I think, answer. Was it, was, was like, I think LeBron James was on the list, and I was nice. excited. But, I mean, I, I was kind of, you know, it's sort of like... Yeah, I'll be, you know, that's kind of cool, but he didn't, he didn't give me a personal phone call. That would have been nice. <laughs> uh, I would have appreciated that. But um no, there were some there were some kids who um who I who I followed up with and I'll will be excited to um feature more. I mean, I think what's great about these um, you know, this recognition isn't so much the personal recognition, but it obviously gets the volunteer name out there. Um, and, you know, you can see the hits go up. We saw that more people were adding opportunities after the Forbes recognition. We saw that more people um, were submitting their volunteers for personal recognition afterwards. Uh, more people were reading our blog. So I think, um, you know, we're really grateful uh, to you guys, to Forbes, um, you know, who are, who are allowing us to spread our mission and our goals to more people. And hey, I'm sure it doesn't hurt when you're trying to get into med school, huh? Mm -hmm. Well, luckily I'm already getting, so I don't have to worry too much about that. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, and that, you know, that's really not important. It, it's, it's our name, our organization that matters most to us. And we really try to showcase to people that there's so many people involved with Volunteer Nation. It is not just the two of us. We couldn't be an organization without our nonprofit pro bono attorneys that helped us obtain the 501c3, without these free marketing um, you know, blogs and articles that are written, without you guys. We can't be an organization without the support of the community. So it's not just the two of us that are you know, running it on a daily basis. We enjoy it and we spend a lot of time doing it, but it's also so many other people that we hope to be able to recognize and hope to be able to under help them understand that Volunteer Nation is really allowed to be on, on a stage like this because of people that are going to the site and organizations that are partnering with us and helping us grow. And just to let our audience know how much you guys are being recognized, I want to mention another man. Some of you might know of him. His name is, what, Obama or something <laughs> like that? How, how'd that feel? Well, um, so I got the phone call about 30 minutes before um, the, the, the speech. And so that was a little shocking. Um, I got a phone call. It calls me out of class. And they're like, uh, this is, you know, some speechwriter, blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, we wanted to confirm the following statistics with you. And I was like, all right, that's, you know, the, this is all correct. Um, and then I got a phone call back 10 minutes later. Uh, just turn on the news, uh, you know, in 15 minutes. 
And so, you know, like they called my school and my principal and we went down and we like watched. Um, and at that point, I kind of had a hint of what was coming. Um, but there is nothing more shocking than than hearing, uh, <laughs> you know, your name on television in that sense. So, you know, again, um, it was an honor. I think that was one of those things where um, I just wrote a blog. Uh, and so I think so did the other kids who were featured. And so the more you put your name out there, the more you put your brand out there, if you blog, um, you know, I guess things like that uh, may happen every now and then. I, you know, I feel we feel very fortunate that we were included in that speech. Um, and obviously it was a great honor. Definitely something to smile about on a daily basis. So I know you guys have some pretty wild dreams, both for yourselves and for Volunteer Nation. Let's fast forward five years. Where do you each want to be? So I think, first of all, um, I want to be gone from the organization in the sense that I want this to be sustaining itself um, throughout the country. And so right now we're moving towards that. Um, but Simone is still working with the interns. I'm still working with partnerships and technology. Now, I think once you see real success is when other people are leading these initiatives. When it's left us and it's left all of our hands and we see that other interns are taking these roles. Other interns are willing to work potentially um, without salary for this mission. And so I think that's our goal. It's just to spread and to continue but without us writing all these emails, without um, you know our our hands on every on every action, every move that we take. Because what's so important for us is that this is a youth-led organization. So young people under the age of twenty-five, which is the definition of youth by so many organizations, like Do Something, Youth Service America, Generation On. We want people to realize that we want it to be a peer-to-peer -peer system. There's nothing worse than a fifty-year-old telling a 10 year old where to volunteer or the importance of youth volunteering we want to be able to grow and develop and we want to have youth understand the skills that you can learn from running a nonprofit organization I want other kids to learn how to run something like this and we've made so many mistakes throughout the time that we've been leading this organization and that's what's so important is that we've learned from those mistakes and we want other youth to be in the driver's seat and be able to do those same things as we have can you let us know maybe one of those mistakes so people can learn from it right now is it confidential? <laughs> well, there's been a lot of little lot, mistakes lot of, along lot, the way. A lot, a lot of failures. <laughs> um, so, um, I think for me, it was probably my first project. So I thought it'd be a cool idea um, to check tire pressure in all the teachers' cars um, in at our school because if you are running with low tire pressure, you're wasting um, a pretty good amount of gasoline. I think it's like two, three, four miles a gallon. Uh, and if your tire pressure is too high, it's really unsafe and you can blow out a tire. Um, and you definitely don't want that to happen. And so we went to the science department and I went to um, like our local insurance, car insurance company, and they gave us all these uh, tire pressure checkers. And we're like, okay, you know, we'll give these to you um, if you guys go check your pressure. Um, but, you know, we were like, ah, oh, you know, what? let's just go do it ourselves. So we went out to the teachers' cars and like checked uh, all the teachers' cars and their tire pressure. Uh, all right, so you went out <laughs> and you started doing this yourself. Yeah, and we like gave like it was like I thought it was the coolest thing. Like I printed out sheets of paper and like gave teachers little like um, like grades based on their tire pressure. We were gonna have a winning teacher and everything. And then one of the administrators found out, and they're like, you know, are you guys like stealing their cars or like what's going on? And so we all, um, yeah, got a nice talking to. Um, and yeah, just overall, like the whole plan was to have kids check their tire pressure. And I guess um, our mode of action uh, wasn't the best. Um, it was kind of one of those things where, you know, you always hear, you know, ask for forgiveness, don't ask for per permission. And it was one of those things uh, where I definitely learned a lot from not asking for forgiveness. Um, but I think there, there's a little limit to that in that case of going around and opening teachers' tire valves and, and putting... Uh, you know, the little, the, the pressure checker on there. Um, you know, I learned a little bit from that. I, I enjoyed it, but not, not, not our most successful project. 